We are here to talk about a book, absolutely. But before we do that, I want to back it up a minute. Because everything that we do at Laurel Elite is based on your why, your strategy, and your goals. So let's talk about you. You know you need a book, you've heard it, you've been to these presentations before, and if you're like most speakers, you know you need a book, but you're not really sure what that means. What kind of book do I need? What does that book need to do for me? That's what we're gonna talk about today. So as I said, everything we do at Laurel Elite starts with your goals. What do you want for your speaking business? Now, I'm going to make the huge assumption that everybody in this room wants a successful speaking business. And what that usually means for most of you is that you want easier, better quality bookings. You want to be seen as that true expert. And of course, you'll want to make more money, right? Great. Annalisa, how do we do that? Well, we need a book, and we don't just need any book. We need a book that does these three very specific things. We need a book that's going to be, come on, little flasher. Yes, woo! Uh, engaging our prospect, speaking to our prospect, and reaching our prospect where they are. Woohoo! Now what? What the heck does that mean? Well, I'm going to walk you through how all of the attributes of a book that does all of those things. So when we think about engaging our prospect, we want to make sure that we've got complete reader access. We also want to make sure that we've got worldwide reach. And lastly, in this section, we want to make sure that we have design consistency across the board. Over in speaking to our prospect, we're thinking about clarity around our outcomes, organi organizing our output, and creating a conversation with that potential client. When we think about reaching our prospect, we want to be targeting our objectives and identifying the tactics that are going to take us to those objectives. Lastly, we want to figure out how the heck we're going to implement that strategy. Now, if those items on this list don't make sense to you yet, don't worry. That's exactly what we're here to talk about today. So we're going to dig deeply into this business scaling model today. On your handout. You've got all of those, so if you tried frantically to write them down, worry not, they're all listed right there on the handout. What I'd like to ask you to do today is to think about where you are with your book. You may have already published a book, you may have a book idea, maybe you've already got three, four, eight books out there. We're going to think about how you can improve what those books are doing for your business today. And we're going to use this really simple traffic light system. Green being, got it, I'm on it, I know how to do that, I can do it on my own. Red being, I don't know what that is, I've never heard of that before today, I don't know how to do that, I certainly can't do that on my own. And yellow in the middle, yeah, you know, I can probably handle that, I can probably do that on my own, I, I pretty much get it, I can do that. So I'd like to encourage you to color in the little boxes today as we go through each of these attributes remembering that this is just for you. It's not for the person sitting next to you. It's not for your spouse or your dog or your kids or your mom. It's only for you. So please be honest with yourself. If you want to fold your paper in half and kind of color in the circles, that's fine too. Uh, this is really just for you. So please do be honest. All right, let's go ahead and dig in. I told you that over in Engage Your Prospect, you need to have reader access. And when we think about reader access, we're thinking about platforms. Where do our readers, our potential clients, hang out? Is it ebooks, audiobooks, print books, video, some combination of those things? Am I across all of the platforms that I need to be in order to reach my client? So go ahead and color in your box where you think you are on that. Next one, worldwide reach. Am, are my books available in my city, in my state, in my region, across the country, 
across the world? Are they in all the places that I really want them to be? Am I able to reach geographically the number of people I would like to be able to reach? And lastly, when we think about engaging our prospect, one of the most overlooked elements is design consistency. Does my branding make me look like an expert? Do I have consistency between my website, my book, my Facebook page, my LinkedIn, all of the places where I am, do I appear as a true expert because I'm consistent? So those are the things that we think about when we think about engaging our prospect. Now, of course, we're in a 40-minute breakout today, so I'd love to be able to dive deep on all of those, but I need to be mindful that somebody else needs this room. So let's talk today about worldwide reach. Why is it important? Who cares? Who cares if I have my book in more than my city? We want to be reaching the maximum number of people possible. And when we're not doing that, when we're not able to reach the maximum number of people, authors, speakers, coaches, consultants, entrepreneurs talk to me about the wasted time. They spend all of that time writing a book. Writing a book is not an easy endeavor. It takes a lot of time. And if it's not doing everything for you that you want it to do for you, there's a lot of wasted time and wasted money. It took money to get there. Even if it didn't cost you anything out of pocket, if it cost you time, it cost you money. That was time that you could have been earning money. Ooh, this one hurts. This is something a lot of speakers talk about. Other people getting the attention that really should be yours. Maybe they're not as much of an expert as you. Maybe you know more than they do. Maybe you've got more degrees. Maybe you've spoken on this more and you've got more expertise. But the person who got there first, the person who had a more consistent book, got that spotlight. That one hurts. A lot of entrepreneurs, speakers, are afraid that they're not going to be able to sell their books beyond their neighborhood, beyond their friends who love them, or perhaps at the back of the room at a speaking engagement. And all of these are really real fears because it certainly is one thing to write a book, but it's entirely another to sell that book around the world. And I think that some of you maybe understand that from experience at this point. Let's talk about potato chips. That was a switch. All right, so suppose, I don't know why, but let's suppose that you wanted to start a potato chip company. You've got grandma's recipe, you're really excited about this. You start making these potato chips and you figure out pretty quickly that you're gonna need to sell these beyond your neighborhood in order to make money at this business. And here's what's really interesting. When we talk about a product like potato chips, it seems really obvious that we need to be selling them beyond our state, that we need to come up with a strategy for how we reach not only both, both coasts, but all of the states in between and Alaska and Hawaii in order to make money. But when it comes to books, many speakers are still acting like the traveling salesman of yore. They're kind of knocking on doors and hoping that bookstores or libraries will carry their book, or they're hoping that these event and meeting planners will take their book as part of the process. So we need to change our thinking around distribution. What is distribution? Well, if you set up a lemonade stand in your front yard, your distribution is going to reach the people in your neighborhood. Maybe the occasional bicyclist from out of town who's going by. If you compare that to a national lemonade brand that's available in stores all over, we see really quickly the difference in distribution and why it's so important. Your lemonade stand certainly isn't going to have the leverage that that national lemonade brand is going to have. And of course, we want our books to have that kind of distribution. That's what we're talking about. Here's another really important element of distribution. And if you write down one thing from what I say and one thing only, please write this down. I see 
publishing houses, for those of you who weren't looking at me, I was making air quotes, uh, publishing houses pop up all over the place. It seems that every speaking and business coach wants to call him or herself a publishing house, and all they really are are glorified organisms to help you to self-publish. And the way that you know the difference, and this is the part that you're going to write down, is because they don't have any distribution. I'm sorry if any of you have already fallen for that kind of a thing where they got you a book but then nothing happened with it. It didn't go anywhere, it didn't sell, nothing happened, it wasn't in bookstores, it wasn't anywhere meaningful. A real publishing house has distribution. It's an important distinction. Let's talk about your favorite pasta sauce. Did you ever think about how that pasta sauce got into the store where you buy it? Distribution, someone had to make that happen. That phone call had to take place so that the trucks would show up and the spaghetti sauce was there. So it's an average Tuesday and you go to the store and lo and behold, they don't have your favorite pasta sauce. Are you gonna go to all the stores in town to find that pasta sauce? If you're super loyal, maybe, if you have some particular dietary restrictions that you can only eat that one sauce, maybe, but probably if you're like most of us and the kids are in the car and practice is over and they're hungry and they're complaining and your spouse is at home and there's work to be done, you're just gonna pick up the sauce that's on the shelf, check out of the grocery store and go home. And guess what? Your reader is gonna do the same thing. If your book isn't immediately available, they're gonna take the next best thing and go home and call it done. And that's why distribution is so dang important. And those authors who think that they can be the traveling salesman and knock on doors or even worse count on Amazon or their website to do it for them are poorly informed because the way that the algorithm works to get you out there is that the paid advertisers are prioritized. So great if you want to spend a thousand dollars, ten thousand dollars, a hundred thousand dollars a month to purchase those keywords, then certainly you could leverage those platforms, but it's not as easy as some people like to make it seem when we talk about distribution. Why? Why is it so hard? Well, it's like when you play Monopoly with your friend and not only do they buy all the little green houses, but now they've got all of the red hotels. We've got a Monopoly and look, the publishing houses, traditional publishing houses are doing that in on purpose. They don't want the competition. Obviously, why would they let the little guys in when they've got the corner on the market on distribution? Now, if any of you are from Colorado, uh, here in Denver, um, you may know that I spoke uh, at every library in, in Denver County, that's Jeffco for those of you who live here. Um, and Denver is a really friendly place for the independent author. It's much easier in the libraries, they've got an application system, um, and in a lot of the local bookstores to get your book there. That's great about Denver, but look, most places are not that open about you having your book there. And at the end of the day, just distribution is something that we publishers meet on at least monthly, but certainly quarterly because things are changing so quickly in the way that books are distributed in the world and conglomerations are being made uh, instantly and every day that we need to meet on a regular basis to talk about our distribution channels and how we're making it happen. So it seems really logical now that you know that, that for the independent author, it's an uphill battle and you know almost a 90 degree climb to get your book where you want it. Let me tell you about Steve. So Steve was one of the many, uh, about 50% of the people who come to me say, you know, I wrote a book and it's just not doing for me what I want it to. It's not selling and now I've got this garage full of books. And so, you know, we, we dove pretty deep with Steve to talk about what had happened for him. And he had gone with one of those, uh, what he thought was a publishing house, but was actually a self-publishing 
operation and we dug into that a little bit deeply and he said you know when I looked at it I didn't want to spend a whole lot of money it seemed really expensive and I didn't want that for myself and I said well Steve let me put it to you this way how much is one client worth if you get that one keynote if you get that one consultation if you get that one coaching client is that worth five thousand ten thousand fifteen thousand twenty thousand and the light bulb went off for Steve and he said, oh yeah, you know, when you put it that way, I can see that one engagement that I would get out of a high quality book would more than pay for the investment to have that high quality book. So he and I, uh, full disclosure, we had to rewrite some of the book and we're going to talk about having a quality mes message today. Uh, but he doubled his book revenue. He no longer has a garage full of books. He can put his car in the garage, which is what belongs in the garage. And um, his, his business is booming, and he's, he's booking a lot of gigs out of that book. So it's a real success story for him. All right, let's talk about you. What are your action steps based on what I've talked about here this morning? What do you know that you need to change about the way that you've been looking at this or the way that you've been doing this so far? The first element of speaking to your prospect is to be really clear on what your outcomes are. And here's a funny one. When I speak to speakers, they seem really clear on what their outcomes in are. But once we dig in a little bit more deeply, it gets a little obfuscated. Anybody have that happen to them before? I thought I knew what I was doing, but wait a minute. It's a little bit more complex, right? And until you get to a point where you've got clarity on everything that you deliver and what you're able to do, you certainly aren't going to be able to communicate that to someone else, at least not in a way that they're going to be able to understand what the benefit is for, for them which leads us to our next one, which is organizing your output. Not only do you need to know what it is that you're delivering, but you need to convey that in a way that people can understand. If you're married or have ever had a friend, I bet you've been in a conversation where you thought you communicated really clearly what it is you wanted to say and the other person had no clue what was happening, right? So sometimes we think we communicate clearly but the message isn't received. And we need to be writing in a way where the message can be received. And lastly, and this is sort of the ninja skill of them all, we need to be creating a dynamic conversation off of a static page. Whoa, how do we do that, right? So this one is the most complicated of all of them here. But once we've started a conversation and we continue that conversation, throughout the course of the book, starting on page one, going all the way to page last. When that reader gets to page last, guess what? They want to pick up the phone and talk to you. So if you haven't already, go ahead and color in your traffic lights. For those, how are you feeling about where you are with your current book or your future book on how those are going for you? Here's what happens when we are not really clear in our organization. We're going to highlight organization because once again, you know, I wish we could spend all day here talking about all things book, uh, but we've got to move pretty quickly. We don't, when we don't have organization, when we're not communicating clearly, our message falls flat, right? We haven't communicated what we wanted to say. And worse than that, someone may buy our book, but they won't even bother to read it. Raise your hand if you've got books on your shelf at home that you have not read, right? I have an extensive to read shelf, it's a collection. Or even worse than that, your reader may read the book and hate it because it doesn't resonate with them, it alienates them, it's incomprehensible and they don't understand. On the flip side, Oh, uh, and so these are the kinds of things at events like this that uh, authors and speakers come to me and they say, oh, this is so complicated, how can I possibly get it right? Is there even a right way? What is that right way? And the ever popular, why is it so hard? Why can't I just put together all of my blog entries and call that a book? One of my favorites. So uh, the reason why is because when we do this right, 
our reader, our potential client, resonates with that message. Our client sees themselves in the message. Who cares? Will you care? Because that's going to skyrocket your no like trust score. And when you skyrocket your no like trust score, you're not only going to get more leads, you're going to get more qualified leads once you have those people on the phone and you're talking to them. Now, when people go to write an expert book, they sort of start on the outside of this circle. They think, gee, I'm an expert in this thing, and I'm going to tell my readers how to do this thing. Here's how to make a better widget. And so they spend a lot of time and energy writing about how to make that better widget. They also think it's really obvious to think about the what. What tools do we need? A hammer. A screwdriver. When do we use the hammer over the screwdriver? Why do we need it? What's the end result of making better widgets? Well, uh, our customers will be happier, our, our employees will be happier with more efficient methods, whatever it is. But here's the part that many authors overlook, and it's the most important thing, and that is your core, your why. Let me tell you my core. I'm a storyteller from way back. As soon as I could tell stories, I was telling them, and as soon as I could write them down, I was writing them down. I was published for the first time when I was nine years old, and I continued to publish throughout my childhood. So that by the time I was in my early 20s, people were asking me, how do you do this publishing thing? Can I do that? And it became my life's mission, not only to help people to tell their stories and share their message with the world, but to do it well so that people would listen. Because I really believe in the power of human connection. And I think that when we're communicating well, we can change each other's lives regardless of the differences that we have. And that was really, really important to me even before I became the senior editor and later CEO of Laurel Elite Books. But something big happened to me about a year and a half ago. And I went out to lunch with a business colleague very much like one of you. And he said, I'm ready, Annalise. I'm ready to write my book. I want this legacy for my children. And I want to share with my clients and people all over the world my area of expertise so I can change lives. And we talked some more about it. And he said, you know, I really want to do this, but now's not quite the right time. I've got the kids and the school year, and we just bought a house, and my wife, and things are really crazy in the business. Let's meet in six months, and I'll be ready then. And we were really good about it. We put a date on the calendar. We were going to have lunch in the same exact spot. And one week before that day, his wife called and said, Eric can't meet with you today. He's died of cancer. And of course, that was really sad for me on a personal level because I liked Eric and I cared about Eric and he was an important part of my community. But the bigger tragedy for me in that was that Eric's message never got heard by the world. It was lost. His legacy for his children, the impact that he could have made for all of those people went with him. And that moved me so much that I knew that I had to help people, not only to get their message out, but to get it out in a meaningful way. Now, that's my core story. That's why I do what I do. You have your core story and why you do what you do. And I'm not proposing that we get all woo-woo about it and that we get too personal, but I am saying that when we share, and we share deeply and we share well, we can make true impact because at the end of the day, every single person in this room has something that they stare at the ceiling at two o'clock in the morning about and it keeps them awake. It's part of the human experience. When we can overcome that and share that with people, that's when we're making a real difference and that's when we have an impact. Some of you might recognize this guy. He is Bob Berg, and if you uh, cyber-stalked me before this session, you saw his endorsements on the Laurel Elite website. 
But more importantly than that, he's a longtime member of NSA and he was inducted into the Hall of Fame at last year's Influence and uh, got his CPA, CPAE. He's the co-author of the Go-Giver books and uh, he, this is one of his five laws of stratospheric success, the law of value. Your true worth is determined by how much you give, how much more you give, how much more you give than you take in payment. So when we're doing that, when we're giving of ourselves, we have a book that works. We have a book that's read. And a book that's read acts like a time machine. That book is working for you while you work. It's working for you while you sleep. And it's working for you while you have a life in conversation with your potential client. You're here at NSA and lots of people have books and so it might seem like everybody in the whole wide world has a book, but it's not true. According to the Bauka report, every year 20 million people have on their bucket list, I want to write a book. And all told, including self-published and traditionally published books, one million people publish per year. What happened to the other 19 million? Not everybody has a book. There's still a lot of room in the marketplace for you to make a huge impact with your book. What else? Well, when we talk about revenue, the real revenue from a high quality book comes from the bookings that you're able to get, whether that's speaking engagements or coaching, consulting, however it is that you're using that book to leverage you. I talk about the money that you get from selling a book as take your spouse out to dinner money. It's nice extra money. It's not the real revenue of a book. That said, if you sell your book for $15, which is a pretty average price for a book, and you sell only 500 of those, you've got $7,500. Some pretty decent take your spouse out to dinner money, right? That could be a cruise. If you sell at the back of the room, and many speakers typically will sell 5,000 copies pretty easily, that's $75,000. It's a pretty nice dinner. Our bestseller just topped half a million books. If you sold half a million books at $15, your take your spouse out to dinner money would be $7.5 million. That's, hey honey, I bought us an Italian villa for dinner, <laughs> right? So, can you make revenue selling a book? Yes, absolutely. Do we call it the main bread and butter? No. All right, so, um, one of the things that many speakers come to me and say is, I know I'm supposed to write a book, but I'm not a real writer. And that's fine. It may be true that you're not a real writer. I think that part of the problem exists in the English language. Here's what I mean. Just because I can talk does not make me a speaker, right? So I could come to NSA and I could talk and I could um and like really painful in front of all of you just because I can talk, I'm not a speaker. And yet in the English language, we have writer and writer. We don't really have a way to distinguish them except when we think about author, right? The root of that word being authority. An author is one who speaks and writes with authority. And you may not be able to write with authority yet, and that's okay. The good news is you're all here at NSA, all presumably speakers at some level, yet here to better yourself. And if you've made that commitment to better yourself as a speaker, you can make that same commitment to better yourself as a writer and be able to hit all of these levels of speaking through a book, through writing, to your audience. Because you only have one chance to make a first impression, so don't waste it. Let's talk about Sarah. 
and the, how she used impact to write a book. Sarah's a real estate agent, and she came with a lot of how. I want to teach people how to get a mortgage, and I want to teach people how to do a home inspection. And as we dug a little bit deeper, we started talking about why that was important to her. Well, she was a millennial with a small family, just starting. And she and her husband were able to buy a home to accommodate her growing family. And that was really important. She wanted other millennials to know that that was a possibility for them, even though there was so much stigma around her generation doing things and moving forward. So she was able to do that. Her book is working for her, uh, booking gigs for her while she's out showing homes. Next section, think about what your action steps are. What do you want to change based on what we've talked about in the way that you do things? All right, I'm moving quickly. Um, reaching your prospect. We're going to talk about strategy here, and I can tell you that one of the things that many speakers, authors, uh, CEOs, entrepreneurs, people we work with, experts mix up is the difference between a strategy and a tactic. If you look at this tabletop, a table, a tabletop is not a table without legs, and the legs are not a table without the tabletop. We need each one to support each other, and they each have different roles. So if you and I are on a capture the flag team, we might be really tempted to grab all of the water balloons and just run across the field. Now that would be a tactic. The water balloons are a tactic. But if we don't make a strategy about how we're going to capture that flag and think about things like where are, are the opponents and where are the trees and what is the best way to get around the pond, then we're probably not going to have a whole lot of success capturing that flag. We understand that in this analogy, and yet so many writers do the, that, the equivalent of grabbing those water balloons and just trying something. Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, Instagram. They're just throwing stuff and hoping that it will stick without thinking about who they want to reach, where those people are, and the longevity of the strategy and its implementation. The real truth of the matter is that hope is not a marketing strategy. I sort of think of it as buckshot. You're just throwing things out and hoping that something will stick. We know that we have a strategy when we're thinking about data. What do the data tell us? What are our demographics and where are they? How do we find them? How do we reach them? What are the metrics? If you're not tracking data, I'm sorry to tell you, but you've got a really expensive hobby not a speaking business, because it's probably losing you money. We've seen this time and time again, and that's why everything that we do at Laurel Elite is strategy and data-driven. Yes, it's a book, but done right, following the data, using a strategy, it's a really powerful scaling tool for your speaking business. How do people fall into this trap? Well, I think they try to go out and do it on their own, and they very quickly learn that my laser doesn't work. They really quickly learn that there's this much work to be done, and they can only get this small amount done. Sort of like being Sisyphus, pu pushing that rock up the hill over and over again. I like to think of it this way. If I took my little tiny sedan onto the NASCAR track, now I don't know too much about NASCAR, but I know they go really fast. And I also know that they have entire teams of people to support them at every step of the way. And I also know that they're professionally trained in order to do that. I, in my little tiny car, would be no match for these professionally trained people with teams who have years of experience going really, really fast. I would be lucky if I survived, never mind thrived. And yet so many authors are trying to compete with professionals that have entire teams and training and experience. Let's think about your action steps. 
when it comes to strategy. The last section is that I'd like you to think about. Please write down this question in the impact box. If you could implement all of the steps that we've talked about today, what impact would that have on your speaking business? Now, I would really love to be able to chat with all of you and hang out in this room t today and talk about your worksheets and where you are and what's really difficult for you, what your successes have been, and what your book has been able to do for you. But they're going to kick us out pretty soon because uh, they've got another session coming in. So here's what I'd like to offer you. On your handout, there's a QR code. Uh, we can chit chat about where you are. We can talk about how you can do this on your own. We can talk about how I can help you. We can talk about where you are and what you'd like a book to do for you. That code is right there. If you're not a QR code kind of a person, the link is here, laurelelite.com scale. And you're always welcome to email me at any time with any questions that you have about your book. Thank you so much for having me today.